Hello and welcome to The Damp Show. Today's episode, I'm going to tell you five things I've learnt in my 40 years, or nearly 40 years, as a plasterer, as a top 1% plasterer. So there you go. All my experience, I think there's a lot. So, let's get into this episode and uh, let's get you some uh, some information in your ears. So here we go. So number one, plasterers make ideal damp technicians and damp surveyors. So as you know, Damp Sam started out as a plasterer 40 years ago or nearly 40 years ago. So 1983, September, that's when I started uh, at Barnsley College as a, a a young spread, or whatever you want to call them, plasterer, spread, um, muck chucker on a, a wall, um, trowelly, I don't know. I don't know all these uh, abbreviations. I know there's a there's a program called Travel Talk or something like that on the tour. Travel Talk, something like that, and uh, I see all their abbreviations and shortenings and what what the, and it did the different up and down country. And someone who met me cringe and someone who met me just stress me out. But um, I just call it plaster. Sometimes I, I don't think I've ever said spread, but anyway, started back in 1983. That was my first time, um, three years at college doing plastering. I did uh, City and Guilds for two years and then I did uh, Advanced Plastering Craft for two uh, for one year. Um, and then went on to um, to have a, an apprenticeship which were going to different uh, companies and uh, being self-employed and learning and um, taking a bit from here, taking a bit from there, making mistakes. And uh, I've culminated in uh, what you see today, top one percenter. So uh, if any of you are out here is in top one percent, put a line in the comments and uh, and let me know because uh, it's uh, lonely at the top, so they say. So uh, here we go. Plasters make ideal damp technicians. Why do I know that? Because that's what I did. I evolved from plasterer through to um what I'm doing now, which is um, damp, I, I own a damp company, All Dry Damp Proofing, limited, limited company, I own um, damp, and damp surveys limited, which is a, um, a limited company that does damp surveys and condensation surveys and things like that, and um, I'm a damp surveyor, I'm a PCA specialist qualified damp surveyor, I'm a certificated surveyor in remedial treatments, I'm also a, um, a certificated uh, surveyor in structural waterproofing, it's, uh, it's hard to remember when you've got all these qualifications, I've got an HNC as well which is our national certificate. But um, and that sent, put me in good stead for other stuff. But the reason why I say that plasters make ideal uh, damp technicians is because r uh, damp work when you're um, hacking off and then reinstating um, fifty percent or sixty percent at work is plas is replastering. Um, that that is like one one of your main things. So. A lot of times your plasterer can do the hacking off, it can do the drilling, injecting, and it can do replastering, so you're not having to get someone else in. So this is why it's ideal for a for a plasterer. If it's handy, he can put skirtings back on, he can take a radiator off, he can cover up. So a lot of profit from that job can go to a um, guy that's doing it. Hence, and I started my, um, my damp proofing company. So this is what, this is what drove me. Well, 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 the money, the 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 profit that you could get, and um, the continuous work that that came in because you could do more or less everything. I mean, I don't do that nowadays. I'll 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 fetch electrician into do electrics, plumber into do plumbing, joiner into do joinery, 
because um, and and they're all best at what they do. So I, I I want a good experience what comes to me. But in early days, I did it myself. So I know I did. I I didn't do plumbing plumbing myself. I could take a radiator off. Um, but some of these older radiators, if they've not been shifted for years, you can if you don't do it exactly, you can sprain valve or you can knock seal on a uh, valve and it'll start weeping and that's the last thing you want because uh, if you've only priced um, a small amount to take that radiator off and put it back on then if you were having to get a plumber back out to sort it out then that eats into your profit and, it, and, and trust me I've done it a few times so what we what we say is we'll just say um, you can get your own plumber to take your radiator off uh, but if you want us to do it, it's going to be X amount, and it's normally a lot more than what um, they'd be able to get a, um, a plumber off for, a plumber to take it off for. So this is why we always said that. But this was my journey from um, as a plasterer, working for local builders. I started off re-rendering, damp proofing in sand and cement render, and that's that's thing that I worked in all time because the the first guy that that I ever um did damp work for it was cheaper for to get sand cheaper to get sand and cement you were um registered with palace I th- I'm saying palace he might have been registered with sovereign but his guarantees were palace so his guarantees were just for product I think cuz I can remember seeing them they were like a blue um paper and it, it was one of them that when you wrote on it, it made three copies. So then he, he gave one to um customer. He kept one, he sent one off to, to Palace, I think, for them to, to log. So um he was a registered user of um Palace chemicals. So they injected it and they, um, they put it in additive. So he showed me how to do it. So it was like, you know, put a couple of capfuls in. And uh, as a young plasterer, you just do what they tell you, you know what I mean? So, yeah, this is how it is. Oh, it, it's, it's not bad to spread. Um, little did I know that that were a big, 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 big bit of the waterproofing. You've got to get your ratios right and you've got to read what's on the um, on the products. And you, when you read it, you've got to do what it says on there. And a lot of times it's, uh, I think it's one... We use a, 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 a litre jug, so it'll be one litre uh, additive to 24 litres of um, water. And uh, and we weren't putting anywhere near that, that, that into, into the mix. And and I kind of realised that when they were doing drilling and injecting as well. He was saying to the labourer, wait till it, because he drilled and injected into bricks, wait till it makes a figure of eight and then pull it off. And obviously, I I knew it weren't filling all brick up, but it weren't my job as a you know eighteen nineteen year old lad to say to you know big builder you're not doing it right. Um, could have been it could have ended up bad for me because uh, you know if I'm applying it, I don't know I don't know where you stand legally, but um, a lot of jobs that he was to do, um, they a lot of cash jobs and things so um it just get me in they'd, they'd do all prep work I'd, I'd come in and just do replastering and that'd be it and it were all in sand and cement and it were all hard and it were all wet and it were water going around electric sockets and pulling taking sockets off at wall wires showing and there, there were old terraced houses and it was just a nightmare um i had to sometimes i had to mix in a bath so sand and cement, if if uh, if it were only a couple of walls, we had to mix in a bath, and the, the, we didn't have a mixer. Sometimes it'd get me a mixer, and I had to mix on myself. So um, and then put it on on my own. So it were it were a big learning curve, um, but from there I applied to a, for a job at Guardian Building Services. So I had a, a little bit of knowledge of remedial stuff um, and putting backings on. So I. I, I I were okay at putting back ins on. So when when it got to about nineteen eighty, went to uh, Guardian Building Services, and they predominantly did replastering for Peter Cox, Rentakill, Timberwise, and Protim. So they were big four. 
um, it must have been, I don't know whether it were a new thing or whether they, they do it all the time, but um, they had contracts for them. They'd get jobs sent through and we'd just go and replaster them. Some jobs you had to knock off. Some jobs were waterproofing. Um, we'd had no training. We got no training. We just went and did replastering and got... Um, I was a guy who used to work for Peter Cox and he kind of showed me what we needed and um, what what you could do and, and and so I got a bit more knowledge there but it weren't you know it weren't what what I should have known um, but it came in good uh, stead for when I started my own uh, damp proofing company up and became a registered user uh, went on training courses and uh, and learn how to do everything right. And this is where I know that um, plasterers make good um, surveyors, damp technicians, because that knowledge of uh, uh, replastering backgrounds, um, what will stick on where, um, that knowledge for a plasterer is, it holds them in good stead for when they're doing their um, exams. And... Uh, and I think that you know, plasterers, if they've if they've got any ambition and they want to make a bit more money, they can move over into um, into the preservation sector. And uh, first step on the ladder is, you know, go on one of courses. So you've got manufacturers courses, you've got PCA courses. I think PCA's two day course, technician course, is the best around. So if you uh, if you fancy doing that, get in touch with. PCA and have a look at how much it costs to uh, to do a course you have to go down to Peterborough it's straight out A1 and it's uh, it's just off at motorway so you, you ain't got to go far and it's a, a unit there that you go and you do all your training and it's purpose made they've got walls they've got rafters they've got they've got everything set up there and it's uh, it's a brilliant two days and you do a little egg like, you do a little test at end and you get a certificate if you pass most people pass because it's not it's not really hard. That's your two day course. It's they give you knowledge. They give you knowledge while you're there. So that's number one. Number two, and this is a this is a, a bit of a contentious one for some people, and it's normally dirty bastards. So a clean plasterer is a better plasterer. And that for me, that is um gospel and it's what I was brought up with. Any tradesman that has the tools shitted up, for me, red card. You know, if you can't keep your, if you can't keep your, your your tools clean when you're a plasterer, when you're waiting for stuff to go off, you just can't spare a couple of minutes just to scrape it with a small tool to get all shit off at top and all shit off at bottom and brush it. it takes me, but it takes me less than a minute to clean mine because I keep on top of it. Um, you don't want it all over handle either, because I've seen plasters where they've got it all over handle. They get some on their hands and they don't wash it off, and, they, and it goes onto their handle, and then that builds up, and it's like bottom of a boat with all barnacles on. Um, the whisks, they don't clean the whisks, so that so they'll they'll knock some they'll knock some uh, finish up or drywall or whatever, and then they just leave it, and then they knock some more up, and leave it, and until it's like thick as out on thing, and then they just break off with an hammer. Um, he talked to any uh, any decent brickies with cement mixers. I mean, you'll have seen pictures online of the, these cement mixers, and they're just all battered all the way around. They've just been hammered, 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 hammered because they, they they let all stuff dry inside, and then they just try and break off, and then they put stuff in again, and try and mix up. But what that does is, and it's same as with um, mixing paddles. There's going to be bits of stuff that's going to fall off, and it's going to be in your mix. So when you're plastering, you you start skimming and you and there's great big rocks in, or, or, well, I'm saying great big ones, even little ones, the smallest little hard bit of um, plaster off it, off it mixing paddle, or even a mucky bucket, it'll it'll make like big scratches in your uh, finish, and that's the last thing you want. So this this is why you need to keep your stuff clean, even your handboard. If you let stuff build up on your handboard, if all, all, all mortar and film um, residue builds up on your on your handboard, eventually it'll start shelling. So it'll start shelling, and then when you when you're um, taking your stuff off, you'll get bits of 
plaster in there. And again, when you when you're skimming, you, it just pulls a train tracker um, in an arc, and you know it's it's stressing me up thinking about it. Can you tell? It's a nightmare. Mucky, mucky, mucky plasters. And it's not just that. You know, when they're putting on, and then it's dropping on floor. And they're not cleaning it up and they're standing in it and then they're walking it all over the floor and then they're walking it outside and then up paths and mixing, mixing area, getting it all over, water everywhere. So my stress levels are up here now. They're up here just thinking about it. A clean plaster is a better plaster. Anybody that's got shitted up tools, um, if you're on here, unfriend me. Unsub... unsub subscribe because uh, I just I just don't think there's any place for it no place for it at all you've got to be a clean plasterer it just takes two minutes to clean your stuff two minutes to clean your stuff I don't care how much you're putting on get a water bucket get a labourer clean it off use a big bucket what you have to do get a big bucket as a water bucket fill it up with as much water as you can and then that that's not going all over when you when you're cleaning off and then you can get rid of that at end of the day. And then when that's dry, not put that in with rubbish or whatever, put it in skip. And you can keep keep stuff clean. Keep changing water in your water bucket. Change it, I don't know, every, every so many mixes or whatever. Put some fresh in. And then you're not getting fat marks all over your um, skimming. So there you go. That's a, it's not a rant, it's a fact. <laughs> You're dirty bastards. You should not be plastering. If you're mucky, if your trowels are mucky, get out. We don't want you. So, number three. Plastering was easier in 1983. No, I've said that wrong. <laughs> plastering is easier in 2022 than it was in 1983 fact that's a fact that's gospel truth why i'll give you a few reasons one scrim so in 2022 we've got self-adhesive scrim not only have we got self-adhesive scrim we've got the pink stuff and we've got the orange stuff that is really high tack and it'll stick to old so even some even some plasterers that's young and uh, listening to this, you all know that some scrim is um, low tack, cheap stuff. When you pull it off, you get that um, that like rand. There's always a bit on edge that uh, that pulls off, so you end up having to pull like this this stuff off. But some of it's like got hardly any tack to it, so you're trying to put it on and it's peeling back off. With that orange and that pink stuff. Absolutely wonderful, brilliant stuff. Back in 1983, you had Hessian scrim and you had bandage scrim. No self-adhesive. So one did what it says on tin. It were a bandage, basically, like what they put on with your pots. It was the same width as uh, self-adhesive stuff, what you put on. But again, with self-adhesive stuff, you know how you get that one little strand that keeps like that comes off and it it, it it bounds up and it bounds up and that till it's a thick line. Well, you had that with bandage scrim on a thinner basis, but it just used to rip it all to bits. So when you're putting it on, if you got that, it was just a nightmare. And uh, and some were cheaper than others, a bit like today. You know what I mean? So you you got like some that, that were really nice, a nice fresh roll, and then you'd have some what, what, what was been in store for ages that, that were like just out of shape and... Some were like even oblong. Did I say oblong then? I meant uh, elliptical, sort of like around like a rugby ball. And uh, then you'd got the uh, Essien scrim. So Essien scrim again, if you got it and it were it were all nice and new, it stayed flat like that. And that, but um, if you had some old stuff, it were like that. So so it had like a curl to it. So when you cut your lens, so you had to you had to pre-cut your lens. So you had to measure like along an angle, measure your lens, and you put them on scaffold, and then you measured your lens. You measured your little bits because you had to mix a, a, a probably half a bucket or a full bucket 
of um, finish up and you put like a stripper finish on and then you had to get your scream and then put it in and then you put your so you you, you do um you do your your corners first because they what most awkward it awkwardest and uh, your stuff would be going off so you did your corners first and you had to put a length along corner and then a length on wall uh, on corner if 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 it were all board if it were all board we it were all game doing that or um or you'd put a full length and then you'd just put an odd dot if it were brickwork just hold it in place um and that would if that would if you were getting putting uh, br uh, browning on walls browning that's another thing but i'll have to come to that later so then you get all these screams on and then uh, what had happened is one, <laughs> one had pull off and it had just start it had peel off and then it had pull off and because they're all into into connected it had just pull all lot down all ceiling down um and if you think that i'm just trying to think of something that's that's disheartening um probably i don't know probably getting a bleb or something in, a, in, in some big script. I don't know, I can't think what would be more, what's more disheartening than that. You've just mixed a, half a bucket to finish up and you've just finished putting all your scrims on and then one just peels off and it pulls every scrim down all over you as well. Like, it's, it's like, you end up like Spider-Man. We, we all scrim all over you. It's an absolute nightmare. Plaster's worst nightmare. I think that, I think that will, that will up there. Um, and yeah, it's the same with bandage skin screen, but they were just a bit better. Um, you had to make sure they didn't float through, so you had to put them on and then let it go off a bit, and then put your um, mix up and then put your first coat on and then your second coat on. And if you did it too soon, then your your screen could float to the surface. Um, and yet, and, and it were quite th it were quite thick as well, so then you had to make sure that. Um, you put it on thick enough to cover your scrims because you didn't want your scrims showing showing through. Am I stressing you up yet? You know, any plasters out there that think that's stressful? Well, it, it well it was it was a nightmare, especially for a young apprentice as well trying to learn. Uh, so there was scrim, they were mixing up in bath. So we've got no mixers. Oh, you, that was the other thing as well. You were, when you were mixing your finish, no drills, no whisks. It was um, what we call a posher. So it was either a bike cog. On end of a uh, metal stick, or there were some purpose made poshers that were like a skeleton one, and I've still got one in the back of man. Um, or and I've and I've seen it, and I've and I used it when I first started. A stick with some nails in, <laughs> a stick with some nails in, and the old plasters who if though if you're mixing a bucket, they had a long gauger. They could do it. They could mix up with a gauger. Some older ones, they'd just mix it with a gauger with hand in a full bucket, like a. a a bucket about that big i've seen it done um so yeah you none of that and then you were, they were mixing in bath so you'd have your bath either um galvanized a tin one or a, if you were lucky you got a plastic one most of the time they'd have had an all in or or, or, or there, was, there was a proper bath so if you're on a site somewhere and somebody might have got a, a proper bath they've took legs off and they, they used to to finish in plug all and then fill put all your water in your bags of water and then put your bags of browning in and then you just start mixing it so you just shovel it from one side to other then from other side to back and then back again and back again unless you were lucky enough to have a, a um a drag which which i ended up getting um but even even a drag were, were hard work Cause you'd still have to get it to the right things and then you'd have to get your drag in. So that were back as and for us. I mean, you said some right abs on you by the time you're done, but your back was just brock. Um, and then when you put it in, because you've got to mix it straight away, just no dust mask, just breathing all browning and all browning smoking. So uh, well ventilated areas you had to, you had to mix in. Uh, better if you could mix outside. But um, yeah, not good at all. Not good at all. And then there were size at bags. So now you've got 25 kg bags back then, 50. So 50 kg finished bags. Um, they were, they were, I was just trying to think how big they were. Well, double size of what you've got now. But then you've got um, 50 kg browning 
and brown and it was just like a coffin like carrying a like carrying a coffin um and if you're working on a site you got to on first day load all house art so my, they'd come and drop all, all stuff off load all house art um packs of plasterboard came in tools uh, called a clip so two plasterboards and it had a paper um strip bonding them and when you came to use one you just rip strip off but for that but for carrying them imagine two um two plasterboards airfin at uh, 12.5s bonded together um eight befores or whatever or biggest sense 2400 be um is it 1200 is it 1200 so imagine having to carry two of them in a clip into house as a 16 year old 17 year old and not just one so and not majority of the time if it's a new house you're going across a batting and all um yeah so um no workwear so you didn't have proper workwear like you do now you didn't have like trousers with pads in um you wore your old clothes so <laughs> you had your old jeans your old jumper your old trainers no work boys your old trainers so um there were no ppe so i think i've won the other <laughs> when i first started and, and listen listen when when i first started 30 years before me um you know they'll put they're still uh going up chimneys and sending kids up chimneys to clean them and stuff like that so it would even harder they'd got to put uh plasterers had to put lats on um and i i know it there's no there's no people who can't go back in time and i get that but i'm just saying it were hard and, and 30 years or 40 years before before i started um it were a lot harder and uh plaster that i used to they used to work with he used to tell me what to you know how they how they used to work he used to sit down and tell us all stories so when they did a big housing estate the first thing they did build is the the they dug a massive uh pit and put water in it and that was to slay all lime so they throw all lime in and that and uh one of the stories they used to say is, is like they used to throw deer dogs in and stuff because it had uh, hydraulic lime and it used to just burn them to bits and burn all <laughs> been all bones off of that so any dead animals just went in there um and like i said they, they used to um they plasters had to put lats on i think um i think joiners ended up taking over that job but um it were all plaster lat on, on walls and things like that uh and and them it, a lot of it were render as well so they had to just majority of the stuff they were putting render on so it's a generational thing. It's a lot harder um, back then. I'm just telling you some of the stories. So definitely a lot harder back then. Number four, you don't have to be on price to make good money nowadays. So um, plasters that are on price, I think a lot of them must choose to be on price because uh, nowadays it's quite acceptable to be on a, a day rate, especially if you're working in big cities and um like london birmingham manchester places like that because um i think being on a price you can only earn when you get to job and i think uh a lot with traffic how it is now i think uh, getting to job i think plasters now prefer to be um, just on a day rate starting at eight and finishing at whatever if they've got to travel uh, and get like a travel money so I don't know whether it's on a, I don't know how many that's on an hourly rate, but there seems to be a lot on a day rate. It's easier for a, for them to just say, I want two twenty a day, or I want two fifty a day, or whatever. Or if you're in London, I want I don't know three hundred fifty a day, whatever whatever they're charging, rather than going so much a meter. So with plastering, there's a lot of renovating stuff. I mean, they might be on a a price actually on sites um and it might be better for them i was talking to zach one of the lads who i went to college with and he does a lot of external render and they get priced for external render and you were telling me that um the meter roll mesh what they put on side of buildings he said that they were getting nine pound 
per meter square meter for that um and i was telling wiki tart well it's a meter wide and if they if they're doing a block of flats or whatever they just drop a roll down so they'll put a they'll put a strip on and then they'll just drop roll down and then just cut it at bottom and then they just trowel it in so nine nine pound a meter for that i suppose it's not bad um but he's same age as me he's 56 but well, it's 56 next birthday and uh i thought he wouldn't have been wanted to kill his son you know what i mean on price again when you're a plasterer if you're on price it's just stress I'm trying to put a bit more on and a bit more on it not bad when you're young in your 20s 30s even 40s but i don't think i'd want to be on a price now unless it's a price that i've <laughs> i've given unless you unless you're doing a private job and you say you know i'll do that room for 600 quid or whatever and you know you can get it done in day or kind of like that that kind of price but i'm th i'm talking prices for third parties not not straight to cl client um so nowadays i don't think you have to you have to be on price i think nowadays a lot of companies will will put you on a day rate and if you're not happy with day rate once you've seen work then you can move to another company if you're if you're good enough if you've got a good name and if you tools aren't shitted up <laughs> number five plasterers need to stay fit to work this for me this is a must you've got to keep your sen in trim and if you don't um i think as you get to your later stages i mean when you're young you probably don't think about it um and when you're young it doesn't really matter so much i think it's after after you get to 30 i think you need to kind of keep your sen a bit more in trim and i think a lot of plasterers who a lot of them that I know that's young, I don't know any uh, artist shape plasterers that that are young'uns. Well, if somebody points to me, oh, he's a plasterer, he's a plasterer. A lot of them either go to the gym, play football, uh, martial arts, boxing, stuff like that. They all do a bit of summit, or they've done it when they were younger and they do a bit of summit. And um, and they keep up with that. Um, but I do know a lot of plasterers who have not, and I can see it affecting them. So my mate um, who used to work with me he said, drop into bits. Back's gone, shoulders gone. He's got arches, foot's dropping in. Um, loads of other stuff. He's still plodding on, but it's killing him. Do you know what I mean? It's it's, it's hard work. It's because it, he's because he's out of shape. The job that is hard anyway is even harder. So. Um, you know, it's a good job he's on day day work because he's probably putting on less and less and less, and and that's what happened. You know what I mean? The hand boards end up being about like that, tiny because they can't hold them up, can't hold their hands up straight. But um, always keep your sending trim, keep your sending fit. Try and wear your PPE, put your masks on, and all. Don't be like me, shoveling in a in a bath. Keep room well ventilated. Um, I mean, when when I was younger as well, they used to say. Um, they used to say to put barrier cream on. They were a big thing about barrier cream, you know, for, for your hands and things. Uh, at college, I can remember, I just remember they had like barrier cream, putting barrier cream on. And they said that, um, which I get with, with cement, that it can, it can cause, um, what's the name of the thing? Uh, it's an eye, no, it's not an itis. It's like a rash that you can get on your hands and stuff and and, it, and lime starts burning and it, and it, your hands dry out and end up going awful but what i've found is with finish i, I always because a lot of apprentices that come they'll get bag and they'll try and tip it up and try and tip it into um into water whereas all my life all i've done is i've put my hands in and put it in with my hands because i know how much needs to go in and then i'll tip last bit you know what i mean save me back um and i think it's done, done all right for my hands my hands are smooth as out. i ain't got no calluses on i've got no the, the, the like women's hands um and when i put them at cider lasses that, 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 that i know like ellen and uh, lou and stuff they can't believe it um and i do work i do work with my hands but um and i don't know whether it's just me I don't know whether it's something plaster, whether it's vermiculite in finish, or um, it must be another product that, that keeps them smooth. 
or is it or 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 do we think it's trowel? You know, when I've got my trowel, my trowel's clean. Is it that sort of rubbing on my trowel? It's not like because it's not shitted up. It's just a, a wooden hand, handle. Is that keeping it? Uh, I don't know. Is that keeping them uh, nice and uh, and smooth? But I suppose if you if you need to have barrier creams, you have um, barrier creams, and that'll that'll kind of stop with creates a barrier, doesn't it? Oh, nowadays they put gloves on. Um, it's all your PPE. So there you go. You see, you've got your five things there. So I hope you enjoyed them. I hope. Uh, I know there's going to be a bit of controversy, and I know that some people are going to go no, and some people are going to go. Do you know what? He's right. You know, he's right. You know that damn Sam. So here we go. That's it. Another podcast finished, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch, if you want to um, any work doing, um, any damp surveys. Damp timber surveys, pre-purchase if you're in and around Barnsley area or in Yorkshire. Uh, get in touch, Simon at alldrydampproofing.com or Simon at damptimbersurveys.com um, If you want to send me photos, uh, join our Facebook group. It's uh, why does my pro- why does my house have, why does my property have damp damp Sam on Facebook. Search for that and join it. And uh, And I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye now.